If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Conner. So we do on average right now three deals a month, single family houses here in our local area. Average profit is $82,000 per house, per deal now on profit. And I don't share that to brag at all. The only reason I share those figures is because there's a big case to be made investing in outlying areas, you know, not in the middle of the big city. And so I have very, very little competition here. And the moral of the story is, as long as you've got the funding and the money ready to go, then you can make significant income and profit in a very, very small area. To the road to growth, success of an entrepreneur. We've raised the bar. Learn firsthand from successful business owners and create your own path to success. I'm going to show you how great I am. It's time to hit the road to growth with team lead of the Enriquez Group, Realtor Vinny. Hi, Road to Growth listeners. Today we have Jay Connor. Uh, he's a real estate investor, author. Connor, isn't what's that one movie? Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, right? Isn't uh, the Connor the main character saves the world? Uh, I'm not sure about that, Vinny. I don't know. However, I, I mean, I love the Terminator movies. And the Terminator I, isn't the main yeah. character named Connor? Something like something uh, Connor. Could be. Me and Carol Joy were dating 39 years ago when we watched it. Oh, <laughs> is this a true story? It's been a, yeah, it's been a while since I've seen the Terminator. <laughs> wow, bringing it back. Um, well, I, I know we kind of I mean talked about it before. We're gonna get into a little in depth about it. Um, but you're a real estate investor, author, teaching people how to basically use other people's money, correct to kind of uh, find these opportunities. Can you walk us through a little more about, I guess, in your words of what you do? Sure. So my wife, Carol Joy and I, we've been investing primarily in single family houses full time since 2003, since 2003 here in a really, really small town, Moorhead city, North Carolina. Our entire target market here is only 40,000 people. So we've been doing that since 2003. We've rehabbed a little over 500 houses. Um, we don't do a high volume. We stay in all of our deals. I've never wholesale a deal in my life. I know how, but I ain't got anybody to wholesale it to, if you know what I mean. So we do on average right now, three deals a month, single family houses here in our local area. Average profit is $82,000 per house, per deal now on profit. And I don't share that to brag at all. The only reason I share those figures is because there's a big case to be made investing in outlying areas, you know, not in the middle of the big city. And so I have very, very little competition here. And the moral of the story is, as long as you've got the funding and the money ready to go, then you can make significant income and profit in a very, very small area. Let me make sure I heard it right. So you said there's around 4,000 houses in your area? 40,000. 40,000. 40, okay. Okay. But, well, no, 40,000 population. Okay. 40,000 population in our target market, which of course is a very, very small market when you compare to other real estate investors. But we have approximately eight different marketing funnel channels that are bringing in leads to us from motivated sellers, off market properties for sale by owners that of course, we're, we're not getting no leads from the multiple listing service, right? There's nothing in there. There's no inventory where we're located. So all the houses that we're buying are directly from the owners of the property. So, okay. So 40,000 people in your town, I mean, my guess is, is you're talking about then what about 15,000 doors? 20, I mean, somewhere on there of like, you know, I really, I really haven't, uh, I haven't run the numbers on the actual number of houses in our total target market. Uh, but the population is a little over 40,000. 
Okay, so let's say hypothetically we're we're talking about two and a half people per 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 door. I mean ballpark of it, and you've done five hundred flips. I mean that's a big percentage of the actual doors in in that that's community. That's true, but again, that's ever since two thousand three. So are you? I mean, have you flipped the same property then? Oh, like of I, course. <laughs> okay, so so you you basically end up getting another uh deal on the property that you actually you know, flipped. i mean that that's out of the ordinary but of okay. course if i've if I flipped over 500 houses here in the local area the chances are i have bought the same house more than once wow okay. <laughs> no it, it, it's 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 wild i mean have you have you thought about expanding outside of your local market or is it just the kind of comfort level or What's yeah I've, I've just made i've just made a business decision um i mean i've got friends that scale you know, the flipping business and they'll be in all different kinds of markets. It's just been my decision, my business decision. I want to be able to drive by any house that my team is doing and rehabbing and getting it ready to sell. I want to be able to drive by within 20 or 25 minutes from where I live or here at our offices, you know. So I've just chosen to keep it close to home. With, with that big of a market share, I mean, are you, do you have a real estate team that you're affiliated with or do you have your own real estate team? I mean, because it, it would seem like there'd be definitely opportunity, especially having that big of a market share that traditional buyers would probably go directly to you or someone you're affiliated with, I would guess. Yeah. So uh, we are not realtors. I'm not a real estate agent. I'm not a realtor. Um, back in 2003, I went one night to the uh, real estate course to get my license. And that man scared me to death so bad. I said, shoot, I ain't coming back here toting all that liability around in my uh, billfold. So I have been aligned with two realtors and one's in uh, one county, one's in the other county where I'm investing. I've had the same primary realtor, Chris, Chris Latham of Realty World. He's been my primary realtor that pulls all my comps, makes all my offers for me. I put all my offers in through him. He's been my main realtor for 19 years. Wow. Well, well let's let's rewind. Um, so 2003 is when you started in this. What were you doing before 2003? Mobile homes. Some people call them wobbly boxes. Some people call them trailers. Some people call them manufactured homes. But yeah, mobile homes. Uh, of course, I'm here in North Carolina. So out throughout the Southeast mobile homes were very, very popular for uh, an affordable housing product. But unfortunately, the majority of the financing for that product for the consumer fell out of favor with Wall Street in the early 2000s. And by and large, that industry is gone on, on the big picture compared to what it was. So I just knew if I ever got out of mobile homes, I wanted to get into single family houses. Now we've done other projects as well. I've build a shopping center from the ground up. Um, I've done uh, condominium developments, but my passion and my love and what I really enjoy are single family houses. Okay. So going back on the timeline, I know we're working back on this timeline and for listeners. I know we kind of usually go to the very beginning and then work our way up, but I'm kind of intrigued with the, the mobile homes. How long were you guys doing the mobile homes for? You and your your. Network. I was born. I was born in that industry. My dad, Wallace Connor, actually, at one point, had the largest retailing company of mobile homes in the nation. He had right at 180 sales centers in 10 different states. Um, so I was ra I was raised in that industry. So it was that background of you know always being around, looking to help people own a home. Um, that ordinarily couldn't. So my background sort of brought me to where I was. But I tell you what, I tell you how I got interested in it, Vinny. This was all the way back in 1993, 10 years before we started. Uh, good friends of ours, Craig and Kim, they were living in Newburn, North Carolina at the time, and they wanted to build their house, but they didn't have any money or down payment money or seed money to build their house. So Kim's daddy lived down in Florida at the time, and he was a real estate investor. And he said, I tell you what, I'll come up there to North Carolina. I will find a fixer upper. He said, I'll buy it for you. You all do the sweat equity and get it fixed up working on the evenings and on the weekends. We'll turn around and sell it 
and you can keep the profit to build your house. Well, in less than 90 days, they pocketed $30,000 in less than, I said 30 days, 90 days. In less than 90 days, they pocketed over $30,000. And I was trying to sell a single wide mobile home and make $3,000. And I said, I like 30,000 better than three. So I knew if I ever got out of mobile homes, that's what I wanted to do. So that's when we started 2003, our very first year, we only did three houses. I didn't want to do more than that because I knew I had a learning curve to go through and Bill back during that time, I never heard of private money back then, never heard of private money, never heard of self-directed IRAs. I was funding my deals with an unsecured, an unsecured line of credit from the local bank at bb and branch banking and trust. And that went along fantastic for six years until January of 2009. And that's when the spigot was turned off. What, and, and we're going to get to that. Um, so 10 years it took you to get out of the mobile home business into the flipping business. No, no. I left the mobile home business the end of 2002 and I immediately started in single family houses. But you said you, 1993, you basically got the idea because oh, yeah, I got the else. idea. That's right. I got the idea. Yeah. Right. So, so what, why, I mean, cause you saw the, the opportunity there. What, what was holding you, holding you back from making the jump? Cause I'm assuming a lot of people, our listeners right here, they take a class, they get an interest on it. They go, Oh my gosh, my friend made a lot of money here, but there's something holding them back. So what was holding you back in that 10 year span? Well, starting? Nothing was really holding me back because I was CEO of the company making hundreds and hundreds of thousand dollars a year mm -hmm. in the mobile home business. We had 65 locations at the time. So I didn't have any desire or a need to change what I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, but I knew if I ever needed to change and I, and I had to change because in um, 2002, we woke up one morning and had $22 million of wholesale inventory of mobile homes and no way to sell them. The consumer finance was gone. So it took about a year to shut that business down. And while we were shutting it down, I was starting up my fix and flip business. 22 million worth of inventory? Of mobile homes. So what you, okay, we got to hear that story. So what happened? You had $22 million of inventory. Did you just go strictly bankrupt? Did you sell them off for, for I mean, pennies on the dollar? I mean, what happened there? No, we came very close to having to go bankrupt. But uh, instead of going bankrupt, we called up all of our vendors and we said, look, I can file bankruptcy and who knows what the bankruptcy judge is going to give you. I said, or we can work together and try to work through this and I get you paid just as soon as possible, as much as I can. So we ended up doing workouts with our vendors. What was your, your, your mindset, right? I mean, your, it was your dad's business. You took it over. I mean, no fault of your own. I mean, it seems like, I mean, outside financing was kind of the issue, but you had $22 million and you had to close down the business. I mean, what was your mindset at that point in time? I mean, was it deflating? Were you still confident in yourself or what, what was kind of going on? Well, that's a good question because my mindset was twofold. Number one, it's a whole lot more fun to start building a business than it is shutting down a business. Hmm. So I didn't wait until we had shut down the mobile home business all the way. I immediately started working on and working towards the real estate investing business in single family houses. And so I had that positive project to work on that. I just really believe that could go places. And of course it has. And um, the other part of my mindset was just a matter of acceptance. And that is, you know, don't go put my head in a hole somewhere like an ostrich. We got a deal with, you know, shutting this company down while simultaneously I'm, I'm working on something very, very positive that I'm very, very excited about. Where did the, the confidence come from? I mean, was it an eternal confidence? Was it basically, I mean, prayer? Was it your, your wife? I mean, where, where did that confidence come from? Uh, the confidence came from the people that I surround myself with. And that's a really, really important point. 
Um, I have been in, my wife and I, Carol Joy and I, we've been in multiple mastermind groups uh, that probably that's the most important um, activity or thing I've done is continue to surround myself with people that have got a similar goal. They got the same kind of outlook. And, you know, when you're having that down day, you got your mastermind members that can help pick you up, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, it's so true. I mean, so you, you have that kind of little bit window of time, you change basically a negative into a positive. Do you start like on your first one? Do you go full bore and do a couple? I mean, what was the first step? Do you recall what you did? Yeah. My, my first step was I just wanted to do one deal from start to finish. Now, for goodness sakes, for those of you that are listening right now to this show, do not make the mistake that I did. And I tell you what, when I started out, Vinny, it was all kinds of mistakes. Well, one big mistake I made was I didn't get the proper education on how to go about doing this business. Right. Mm -hmm. So the first six years, I was really reading books. Right. I was in a positive mastermind, but I wasn't in a group of where other People were successful real estate investors. And when my business really took off was when I really got an excellent mentoring coach that worked with me and really held my hand. And that's what I advise. Don't start out on this business by your own. Be working with somebody that not only has been there, but is also an active practitioner. Because I tell you what, what the, the one of the main ways I'm getting my leads today for my real estate deals, I wasn't even doing. It wouldn't even existed uh, three or four years ago. So I want to be working with somebody that is actually active in the business. What's your first step? Because I mean, I mean, I think it's an it's a it's good advice. And one of the most intriguing things that I've probably talked about most times I have a investor on here. I know at least in Southern California, one of the biggest flipping companies makes more money off of their classes than they do on their flips, right? So what's advice would you give to that student to find the right coach? I know you kind of already talked about a little bit, but also to make the steps to actually do your first project. Yeah. Well, the best advice I can give is vet them out. If you know somebody that has gotten training or educating, or education from someone and, and that referral that's coming to you is someone, you know, that you can trust. Referral is always the best. Um, of course, be involved in your local real estate investing association, also known as REITs. Mm -hmm. And so uh, become involved, be a volunteer, volunteer to serve in your local real estate investing association and ask around with the other members, what other types of training have they had that's been beneficial? In fact, some RIAs themselves offer their own education to the members of the Real Estate Investing Association. So then again, as I said, referral and word of mouth is the best. All right. So you're you're building up steam. You're doing well. You're getting money from the, the banks. Then this chaos happens where they say they're not going to give you money. So what happens next? <laughs> well, I tell you what, this was the pivotal moment in our business. Now, Vinny, I know you may find it hard to believe, but here in North Carolina, we still actually have these handsets <laughs> with cord attached to them. I know a lot of people don't even know what that is. But anyway, Vinny, I was sitting right here at this desk, January of 2009, and I had been borrowing money from the same banker for six years. And I had two houses under contract to purchase. So I pick up my telephone and I call on my banker and Steve gets on the phone. And after we had a little chit chat, I told Steve about these two houses that I've got under contract to purchase. Well, Vinny, just like that, I learned over the phone from Steve that my line of credit had been shut down with no notice. I said, Steve, why are you shutting down my line of credit? We've had a fantastic relationship for six years. I've never been late on payments uh, with you in the bank. I got an 800 credit score. Why are you shutting me down? And Steve said, Jay, don't you know there's a global financial crisis going on right now? 
I said, no, but now you've given me a global financial crisis. I got these two houses I can't fund. Sure would have been nice to know that you had shut me down before I put down earnest money. And back then I couldn't get the money back. So I hung up the phone and, and by the way, Vinny, these people are going around saying, oh, every, every problem you have is an opportunity. I want to throw up. I didn't have no opportunity. I had a problem, right? So I sat here for a moment and I thought to myself, and here's a writer downer. I asked myself, who do I know that can help me with my problem? By the way, Dr. Benjamin Hardy and Dan Sullivan, I wrote a book not too long ago called Who Not How? right? Who do I know? Who do you know? Well, immediately when I asked myself that question, and by the way, the power is in asking the right question. When I asked myself that question, who do I know that can help me with my problem? I immediately thought of Jeff Blankenship, who lived in Greensboro, North Carolina at the time. We've been best of friends for years and years. He was investing in real estate at that time. So I called up Jeff right away. I said, Jeff, and I told him what had happened at the bank. He said, well, welcome to the club. I said, what club? He said, the club of losing your line of credit. My bank shut me down last week. I said, well, Jeff, how are you going to get your deals funded? He said, have you ever heard about private money? I said, no. He said, have you ever heard about self-directed IRAs? I said, no. So I studied that and I put my program together. What do I mean by my program? my program, my private lending program to where I would offer other people and teach them how they can make high rates of return safely and securely. So here's what I did, Vinny. I took my hat. Now this is my private lender teacher hat. That's what that says, my private lender teacher hat. And here's how I went about, and I never asked anybody for money. I started teaching people in my own network people in my cell phone, email list, people I go to church with. I started teaching them my private lending program, the interest rate I'd pay, how it's secured by uh, real estate, how it's going to be a higher rate of return than they can probably get anywhere else. So I started teaching them. I put on a private lender luncheon and I invited about 20 people to that luncheon. I raised $969,000 at that one luncheon. But here's a, here's a big part of the magic secret sauce. And that is, side note, desperation has got a smell to it, right? Desperation has got a smell to it. So we separate the activity of teaching the private lending program to where individuals just like you and me can earn high rates of return safely and securely. We separate that conversation from having a deal for them to fund. So first of all, they just come in, they say, yeah, I like the program. I like the interest rates you're paying. I like the loan to value. That's conservative. I like how you're putting my name on the insurance policy to protect me as the mortgagee, et cetera, et cetera. So then they like the program. Now, if they've got retirement funds, I'm going to introduce them to our self-directed IRA company that we recommend our private lenders use. So they're all set up to go. And then here's the other big magic secret part of it, Vinny. When we've got a deal for them to fund, I don't pitch a deal. I've never pitched a deal in my life. What do I do? I pick up my phone and I call them with the good news phone call. Well, what's the good news phone call? Well, Vinny, let's say you're one of my new private lenders and you've told me you got $150,000 that you want me to put to work for you. And I told you I would put it to work for you right away. So a few days go by, I pick up the phone and I call Vinny, my new private lender. And I say, Vinny, I got great news. I can now put your money to work. You see, you're, you've been waiting for the phone call, particularly if you moved your retirement funds over to the self-directed IRA company. And my recommendation, you're not making any money on that money until I call you with the good news phone call. So I call you up, Vinny, I got great news. I can now put your money to work. And then I tell Vinny, my private lender, four things about the deal. I say, Vinny, I got a house over in Newport. So I tell him the area. I didn't tell him the physical address. He could care less. Vinny, I got a house over in Newport. The after repaired value is $200,000. The funding required for the deal is 150,000. 
I know you got 150. You already told me waiting for the good news phone call. And then I say, Vinny, closing is next Tuesday. So you'll need to have your funds wired to my real estate attorney's trust account by next Monday for closing. I'm going to have my real estate attorney email you the wiring instructions. End of conversation. Notice I didn't say to Vinny, do you want to fund the deal? Of course, Vinny wants to fund the deal. I mean, that's the most stupid question I could be asking Vinny because I'm not going to bring a deal for him to fund unless it matches the criteria of the program that I already taught Vinny. So again, separate teaching the program, how they get high rates of return safely and securely, and then having a deal for them to fund. Critically important. Well, two things. Has anybody told you that you sound a lot like Jim Rome? Um, I'm sorry, like who? Jim Rome? No, I need to. I, I know who Jim Rohn is. I got to go back and listen to some of his. It, it, a couple of times, I'd be like, "Oh my gosh, man, this is like even some of the mannerism, the tonality of it." I was like, "That's kind of funny right there." Anyways, <laughs> so I, hate, I was channeling Jim Rohn and didn't even know it. Uh, all right. So, what's? I mean, again, you've done five hundred. I mean, um, put five hundred opportunities. I, I know since two thousand and nine. I mean, the values pretty consistently have gone up over um, the United States and we all that kind of stuff. So <sighs> has there been less desirable outcomes? I mean, what's, I mean, any hiccups? I mean, I know you said that everything's protected and there's always things can change when you're dealing with the real estate. What are those outlier situations? Have you had those? What kind of happens in those situations? Well, first of all, when we renovate or rehab a house, it never comes in on budget out of 500 of them. They never come in on budget. They always cost more than you think it's going to cost. That's why the magic and why this business works is in the offer. So what I mean by the offer, I, I say I make lots of room for Murphy. And Vinny, you know who Murphy is, right? I mean, some, some, sometimes Murphy shows up, uh, you know, if anything can go wrong, it will. Sometimes Murphy's uh, distant relatives and cousins and aunts and uncles show up in a project of unexpected stuff. So we always, always make room for the unexpected repairs, even when you're getting a full, you know, home inspection. But in addition to that, um, let's be totally transparent here. I mean, sometimes I've made a whole lot more money in profit than I thought I would because the market was going up. Sometimes I didn't make any money because of, you know, unforeseen circumstances. The most important thing that I understand is every one of our private lenders, all 47 of them have gotten 100% of every penny of interest that was promised to them. And again, the reason for that and the reason we can do it is we don't borrow more than 75% of the after repaired value. I didn't say 75% of the purchase price. You see, one reason I love private money is because we always bring home a big check when we buy. How do you do that? I borrow more than I need to buy the house and I borrow more than I need to rehab the house. And that formula only works when you are able to buy houses at significant discounted prices. Either the seller's in distress personally or the property's in distress or all the above. So that's the reason. I mean, that's how we can bring them a big check. I mean, we never take any of our own money to the closing table when we buy and we pick up multiple checks on every transaction. So one of my favorite phrases on my real estate attorney's check stub is excess cash to close. And I tell you what now, Vinny, I like me some excess cash. What's, I know you talk about 150,000 a year analogy. Uh, what's the minimum? The minimum for my private lenders to invest? Yeah. 50,000. So most of the time, obviously I can't buy a house for 50,000 but I can use 50,000 in a second position or junior lien position for the rehab. So 
I, I do a lot of deals, but we'll have more than one private lender secured by the same property. So here's an important point, and this is called total loan to value, total loan to value. So back to our example, let's say I got a house with an after repaired value of 200,000. Well, I could borrow a hundred thousand dollars from one private lender in first position and then $50,000 from a second private lender in second position. So we add both notes together, the 100,000 and the 50,000, add them together. My total amount borrowed is 150,000 from both lenders divided by the after repair value. I'm still at a 75% total loan to value. Uh, thank you, Jay, uh, for being on the platform. If people are looking to get more information also, um, if they're looking to purchase the book, I know you said for the guests listening to the Road to Growth podcast, uh, that there'd be opportunity to uh, get a, a free book if you pay for shipping and handling. Where can you get the information? Absolutely. Okay. So the name of the book, and by the way, you can't download this. We actually mail it to you in the mail. Uh, it's where to get the money now, how and where to get money for your real estate deals without relying on hard money or uh, institutional lenders. Pick up the book. I'll autograph it for you at jayconner, J-A-Y-C-O-N-N-E-R.com forward slash book, jayconner.com forward slash book. It'll put you on the road to having all the money you need and want for your real estate deals. I'm going to finish up with this last question, Jay. Um, is your is your father still around? Yes, he's 90 and a half years old and he's still right slap dab in a housing development that's got 300 houses. He's got about 150 of them built. And I said, dad, you better finish this project before you check out because I don't want you leaving this mess in my, in my lap. <laughs> what, what's, what was his thoughts on your transition from running the company that he started compared to running this company that you've built? Yeah, well, it's funny. The very first house I put under contract, I was using the bank's unsecured line of credit, right? And uh, so dad and I were having, so this goes all the way back to 2003. So dad and I were having lunch at Ruby Tuesday's restaurant. And I had this first house under contract uh, for $50,000, my very first one. And I was using that unsecured line of credit to buy it. So I said, dad, I got this house under contract that I'm going to fix up and sell. Let me show it to you. So he got in the car. We, we rode down there to the house on Mayberry Loop Road here in Moorhead City. And we got and It's not the best street in the world, if you know what I'm saying. And so we got out of the car and uh, we walked up and the realtor had given me the lockbox code. Well, I opened the door. There was this little teeny tiny path about this wide. And on either side of it, there was junk piled all the way to the ceiling in this house. Dad and I couldn't even walk into the house at the same time. He had to go ahead of me. He took two steps in, turned his head back around and looked at me and he says, son, have you lost your mind? <laughs> I said, well, I don't know. I'm getting ready to find out. So I bought it for 50, put 50,000 worth of renovations in it, had a hundred in it. And, um, I was putting it on the market for 140, 139.9. Well, guess what? I put it on the market in January. It went 45 days with zero showings. And I had it maxed out with staging and everything. So I'd read in one of them other books. If you put owner financing in the classified ad, your phone will ring off the hook. Well, it did. My phone blew up. The first guy I met there offered me an $18,000 lease option deposit. I didn't know what a lease option deposit was, but my dad told me if anybody offers you money, you take it and you'll figure it out. So I took that $18,000 lease option deposit. I was an active mortgage broker at the time and Linwood, my buyer had a 583 credit score, mid score. I could get him done at 580. So I cashed him out with USDA financing uh, on that very first deal. And, um, you know, it's been a journey ever since. Yeah. Seller financing is, is a great avenue. You can get creative with those kind of things. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jay, for, for being here today. Hopefully everyone got some, some great nuggets. Um, if you want more in depth about the private lending, 
I mean, using your money instead of just sitting there, uh, go in the show notes, uh, go get the book. Uh, thank you. Thank you, guys. Please subscribe. Please share and go find Jay. Bye, everyone. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's jconner.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconner.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor.